Today, we're going to be talking about the Canon EOS R5, silent shutter, and sports photography. This is Behind the Shot. Hi, as always, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel, and this is the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all those stories and challenges that happen in between, because you know there are always stories and challenges that happen in between. I do want to remind you, if you want to see today's photo, if you're listening to the audio version of this show and you want to see today's photo, make sure that you go to the website. It's behindtheshot.tv. All the links are there that we're going to talk about today. I've written a small little blurb about the guest that I've got on today and pretty much everything that you're going to need, which does bring us to today's guest. I'm excited for this one because this is a sport I absolutely dearly love. Washington, D.C. based sports photographer and a Canon Explorer of Light, Simon Broody. Simon, how are you, man? Uh, Steve, I'm good. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure to have you on. Your work is nothing short of stunning. Uh, I, I the, uh, the people who watch this show regularly know how this works, but I'll go through somebody's site, you know, try and learn about them and understand those traits that kind of transfer from photo to photo for a photographer, because we all have that kind of common theme in a lot of our photos. And your photography, you've got stuff, I, I think I sent some to you at one point that we were talking about possibly doing, the slow, the, you know, the the drag shutter or panned bobsled shot, and your eye, man, is amazing. Yeah, thank you, man. I mean, what, what, I don't know how I can't top that, Steve. Well, I mean, that's you know, I'm, uh, I'm here the, to, to is on the way. Well, and here's the thing. There's about 50% of the people that watch this on video and about 50% of the people listen to the audio and many of them have told me they don't want to see the shot until after we describe it because they want to see if they can picture it right. And I want everybody to know ahead of time that that the way Simon shoots, you'll see common themes in his shots of really unique angles and really unique points of view and in every way, your choices tell that story. And, and that brings me to your background, because as I was browsing your portfolio, there are, you've shot it seemingly all over the world. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah, yeah. And beyond it. Sometimes. And beyond it. Okay, good. Mars Rover has has competition. There are There are things in your background, I wonder if they color your photography. So you're, originally, you're from London, England. Uh, obviously spent time being raised there, but you were also raised in Cape Town, South Africa. And I'm wondering if if that upbringing, the multicultural, the multinational type upbringing, does that international flavor in your life color your photography, do you think? Wow, that's a pretty deep question to start with steve i'm not that deep either mate so uh i dive in i, I suppose i suppose there is some yeah I, I i mean i've always loved traveling so uh i don't know uh yeah i mean you definitely get a different outlook on life just because i spend time in a different country so i would say that that definitely plays in i mean i think i was lucky enough to you know, work as a sort of grunt or gopher in a photo agency, and by by doing that, I got to see so many different types of photography connected to sports. Which and I think that sorry, no, I was just going to say, and that makes sense. Is with what you shoot being sports, obviously you've got sports that are different popularities in each of those countries, right? I mean, obviously, football, as you would know it, soccer, as we would know it in both countries, um, other sports that are going to be native to a particular country. And that that's kind of what made me think of it, is when I look at your Olympic shots, which are multiple sport, um, the bicycle stuff and, and stuff like that. By the way, the bicycle stuff is just so awesome. But when I look at those type things, it, there's got to be something in there to me that you have seen sports differently than a standard American that watches the NBA, Major League Baseball, and the NFL. 
right? Because you've seen different styles of an athlete, of an athlete using their body to accomplish something. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, yeah. I mean, I think working in that agency when I was young, um, that was defining for me because the photographers who were working in the agency called all sport at the time, they were very, very good. And they were brilliant with long lenses. And at the same time, the agency was uh, syndicating work from a, a French agency. And the French agency material, it was a company called Vandistat. And the French photographers were shooting, climbing in the Maldives. They were the skiing in the Alps in this these incredible colors. And I think that sort of combination for me allowed me to sort of, you know, break, you know, like try to shoot a little bit more like the French while whilst having this ability to use a long lens, which I learned through that funding agency. That just, that brings a thought to my mind though. I mean, obviously you want to know your subject, right? Obviously you want to know the sport that you're shooting, but for some, for a French photographer that's photographing skiing in the Alps to then suddenly turn around and go shoot American football would be a drastic change. Sure. And I'm guessing for you with your upbringing or what you shoot now, are there any sports now that if you were to, cause you've shot kind of everything, it seems like, but are there any sports now that if you were to, if you were to walk to the sideline of that sport side court, whatever it is of that sport, that there would be a little, uh, a little trepidation of, I hope I get this right. Cause this is not a sport I know well. You've always got to have a little bit of trepidation. You've, you've got to have, you know, you've got to be a little anxious, nervous. Um, otherwise, for me, there wouldn't be a point of shooting. I, I got to be like really kind of on it. I've got to be thinking solely about what I'm about to photograph. So that all helps me. And, and obviously, as you point out, Steve, shooting something different, uh, that really sort of, uh, heightens those senses for me because you know it's not just that I want to make a great photograph it's like am I am I going to get hit or you know I'm going to be in the wrong place and get run over that wouldn't be a good move um, so I, I, I like this uh, ability to shoot lots of different sports yeah and you do it quite well your your client list is like a who's who ESPN Nike Reebok Sports Illustrated the International Olympic Committee, of course, Canon, because you are a Canon Explorer of Light, which I've had a number of Canon Explorers of Light on, and and like all the camera companies have their ambassadors, this is an elite group of people that you're in. Uh, you've shot for the England Lawn, Lawn and Tennis Club, so your, your client list speaks highly. Your photography has won some awards, and as I was looking through the awards that your photography has, has acquired... A couple of them stood out to me because, I mean, let's be honest, there's award levels in photography, you know, local photography level being one of them. And then these international awards, the Lucy Award for Achievement in Sports Photography. Yeah. Accomplishment, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's obviously, yeah, I mean, I don't know really what to tell you about the awards you know they um they're great world press yeah. foundation was one of them london observer yeah. world's 50 greatest sports photographs when i when i read that quote when i read that that you know accolade, you're embarrassing me steve i thought we were talking no, no, about no. one and, and here's the thing though i don't mean it as i don't mean it as you know let's make simon blush type thing right yeah but mm. but when you yeah <laughs> right there you meant yeah uh, yeah. But when when Make you up. reach a level where when you reach a level where your photography is recognized like that, that does have to be called out because I use some classic sports photography when I talk to other photographers. For example, I'm a music photographer and everybody's always worried about high ISO, ISO noise because we live at 3200 and 6400. And I keep telling them the most classic photos of our day of at least my life because I'm older. The most classic photos of our life are filled with noise and nobody ever looks at, at Muhammad Ali standing over Sonny Liston and goes, oh man, a lot of noise in that, Yeah. right? They don't do that because a, 
an, an iconic sports shot is just that. It's iconic. It, it is something generations know about. And and that last one, 50 greatest sports photographs, kind of, kind of puts you into that. And you take it to, you take it to a point where I think, I think what I'm seeing in your photographs as I look through your portfolio is you tend to really use the features that are on a camera, right? You, in all of your photographs, whether it be the way you drag a shutter or, or raise a shutter is, is very evident in your choices. The way that, uh, you pan like you're one of the most amazing, a lot of people like sports, motorsports photographers pan. You're panning in use of sports I've never seen before. I don't normally see pans like yours of bicycle races or slalom or whatever at sports. That eye, that point of view is brilliant. So when we get cameras like an EOS R5 that has silent shutter, that's a feature you can utilize. And we're going to talk about that in today's shot. Before I bring up the shot, though, I'm curious. Somebody who shot as long as you have, somebody that shoots what you shoot, when a feature comes out like a silent shutter on an R5, what goes through Simon's mind of, oh my God, this is game changing for me. I don't have to use, you know, X, Y, Z so that somebody doesn't turn and yell at me. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was jumping up and down. I mean, I, I I was ranting and raving to a good friend of mine in the UK, and uh, you know, I was equating it to not quite as you know dramatic as analog to digital, but I think it's pretty damn close to that shift. I mean, certainly for me. I mean, and the mirrorless in general, right? Mirrorless in general. Um, you know, I don't. I, I mean, I don't. I don't know if like the technical side of thing really. I mean, I, I need to know certain things, Steve. But you know, I, I'm I'm not really into writing white papers or or figuring all that kind of really interesting stuff to some people out. For me, it's about taking the camera, getting out there, and um, I mean. As much as I want to tell you, yes, you know, I go out there, Steve, and I run through this checklist of mine, you know, that I've got to do this and do that. It's actually probably a lot of, that's probably a lot of bollocks. I'm just really bored. And uh, I'm like, what's it going to do at an eighth of a second, mate? Uh, yeah, let's give that a crack and, and and give it a go. And then go, Jesus, that looks actually, wow, why have I been shooting all that other stuff, you know? So um, I think it's, a, it's certainly a mix of of all of what you've talked about, but I'm bored quickly. And, you know, I feel like I got that shot. Now, what else am I going to do? Okay. You know? So that's a really good point though. First of all, I kind of wonder if most photographers bore easy. I, I yeah. because a lot of people I talk to, it's kind of that same kind of point of view and attitude, but you made the comment of experimenting and I'm, I guess that brings in the question of you're on a job, you're on a paid job. Sure. You, you know, you've got the safe shot. Right. Then you experiment, right? You're not starting with the experiment. How, how, how do you know when you've got the safe shot? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good point. I, and I, I, I would say that's been a somewhat of a mantra for me because, you know, the client is paying you to go to do an assignment and I've always felt obligated to come back with something for the client and probably something along the lines of what they've talked about a little bit. Try to make it work along the, uh, the layouts that they've shown me. And then after that, when I feel that there is, you know, I've either got close or I nailed it, I feel like there's a, you know, certainly an ability to put my spin on what is happening in front of me. Um, and I, I, I gotta say, I mean, if you don't do that as a photographer, then you, you really get trapped a little bit because you don't experiment and you, photography becomes just a job. And, well, and, and the and, experimentation, at least in my opinion, 
the experimentation is where our voice lies. Right. Right. Anybody can go do the checklist. I mean, not yeah. anybody, but you know what I mean. Uh, but but your your photographic voice yeah. lies in the experimentation. Yeah, you're, you're dead right. I mean, I think that's a really that's a crucial point that photographers have got to remember. Um, and I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've had editors in lovely offices in big cities telling me this is how it's going to be. And I've gone to do what they wanted. And there's no way I'm going to do what they have dreamed up. And I think it's 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 important. Obviously, I have to adapt, but then you've got to use your own vision and show them along with what they were asking for initially. I, I, I think that's you know I, I'm not, I've never been ballsy enough just to go, that's it, take it or leave it. Right. I, I've always wanted to work again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, real quick for those of you that are listening on audio. Uh, keep in mind, you can see all the links that we talk about. You can see the photo itself over at BehindTheShot.tv. And uh, there's just find the, the blog post for this particular episode. Again, I wrote a little thing about Simon. Gives you a little bit of his history, all the links uh, to reach him. Also, if you are watching this on YouTube, because keep in mind, the podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts in either an audio format or a video format. You can subscribe to one or the other, or for that matter, both. And the video is also available on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure that you go down, click the subscribe button while you're down there, click the bell. When you click the bell, there's a menu, choose all. That way you know whenever a new uh, episode or show is released, including the critique shows that I do with my buddy Don Komarechka. So that kind of brings us into some some questions about photography in general before we bring up the shot. Shooting high-end sports photography. In the years you've been shooting it, what what are the most definitive changes that you've seen in the world of high-end sports photography? Because clearly the shots from today and the 70s are different, for example. What, what are the changes that you've seen in your world? I mean, you know, autofocus was a game changer um, in sports photography. You know, that, um, that really leveled the playing field between guys and girls who could actually manually focus. Um, and that brought everybody onto the same plane. So kind of a, yeah, autofocus would definitely be the first thing. And then obviously, secondly, you know, digital, uh, the trans, the move to digital was. Did you enjoy that, by the way? I, I did because I was, there was never any pressure to, to work digi di digitally. You know, a lot of newspaper photographers and agency photographers were forced in on the early part of it where the cameras, you know, you pressed it, you waited 10 seconds, right. and you got an image. And in sports, you know, that you had to re-dial in how you shot. And so I never, I went from a, I think um, I've got it behind me. I think it's a, a V, Canon EOS 1V film camera. And I went straight to their digital camera, which was, Almost the same. Almost the same. So you know, it's, the ergonomics it, were the same. The dials were the same. I, I didn't really change anything. I just obviously the workflow changed the back end for me. But um, I never had to go through this. I mean, I, I've talked to some of those guys who had to press the shutter and. Yeah, huge lag. <laughs> Huge lag, yeah. low megapixels, which, okay, but that brings in a big problem. Like you said, that obviously won't work in sports, which it won't work in a lot of different forms of photography. Sure, sure. But, but in the world you're in, you know, for that matter, even high school sports, this statement would be true. So I don't know what I'm talking about. But in the world that you're in, in the high-end sports, you live by one-time moments, sure. moments that will not happen again that you can't yeah. stage again, right? You're not a wedding photographer that can say to the bride and groom, you know what, I need you to stand under the, the canopy again and pretend to do the ring because somebody walked in front of me. You can't do that, right? Yeah. So I've tried it a few times, Steve. 
You right. don't see me running on the field naked trying to get them to redo <laughs> that play. It'll do it. Look over here. Well, but that's the thing, though. Running naked would answer this question, too, by the way. But how do you keep focused over the length of a game? Because when you're shooting, it's it is literally for hours. Critical moment that, oh, I need to capture that after critical moment. Oh, I need to capture that for hours on end. That's that mentally. It reminds me of there. There are musicians I know when they come off stage, they won't talk to anybody. They go hide in the, the dressing room for a while because they just need to kind of shift their brain point of view. How do you stay focused for that kind of time, moment after moment? Oh, man, I missed it. Yeah. Um, Christ, I wish I knew. Aside um, from running naked down the field. Apart from that, yeah, that, that fear, obviously. Um, I mean, the concentration thing is something that is kind of underplayed by a lot of people who, who, who work in sports. I mean, you, you really have, if you're not concentrating, as you just pointed out, you miss it and there's no getting it back. So you have and it could to be, kind of, it could literally be the cover shot. Sure. Yeah. And it's gone. And you're like, okay. I mean, I certainly don't feel good. I mean, I'm like, yeah, I, I need to be locked in a small room with no windows and padded, you know, for sure. When it all goes pear shaped for me, um, I'm not particularly pleasant to be around when I miss it. Um, it's just, but the concentration so, is, is king. You got to be, you got to, I don't know how I do it. I don't know if I do it that well anymore. You know, the, the smartphones are, you know, they, they kind of, they're part of me now, you know, and it's, it's right. really difficult in a down moment because I'm so important. Somebody would have, you know, WhatsApp me or texted me or emailed me or TikTok me or whatever it is. Slack, slack me. Oh my God. All of these things are sent to distract you. And, um, yeah, and you've got to, you've got to discipline yourself to concentrate. And, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm waning. There, there, I'm, there I'm losing times, that battle theme, you know? I know the feeling. There are times I tell myself, put your phone in airplane mode. And that's a, str I, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because you know, that's when the important call is going to come in. When you go into a shoot, do you have a shot list in mind or is it purely seat of your pants? Uh, um, no, I've thought about it. I mean, I've, I've, yeah, I've mapped out in my mind what I'm planning to do uh and then of course when i get in there i realized that that was you know what was i doing i would be better off you know painting a white wall somewhere um so i mean it's it's definitely for me i like to have an idea of what i'm going in to do but nine times out of ten i get in there and it's like really you thought you were going to do that simon you're crazy right. so here's the question you know it's it, this is the lemon juice on the cut has there ever been a critical shot that you afterwards realized you missed? So many, man. So many. So many. Surprising that I'm still bloody working. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. remote cameras not working. Uh, wrong end. I mean, I, 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 I just actually, yeah, somebody asked me a, a recently about uh, um, there was a headbutt in a World Cup final between a famous soccer player, Zidane. And I think there were like five to 600 photographers in that stadium at the time. And I think it was not more than three photographers got it. And that and I was is, not one of the three. Let's put it like that. Well, and that's not uncommon. Like in my world of music, inevitably, the jump in the air, they're facing that way and I'm on this side. Yeah. Yeah. And they do it three times in a row. Right. So I walk to the other side going, he's going to do this again, and I'm going to be over there. And he turns around and does it, and I'm shooting his butt again. Yeah. So in in my world, I have to research because there are a lot of bands I'll go shoot that I either don't know their music very well because it's a different genre, or I don't know, I know the music, but I've never photographed them live. I don't know what their light show's like. I don't know what their stage presence is like. I don't know where yeah. each member is. For what you shoot... You go photograph a, a team sport. What kind of research do you do? For example, okay, I've shot soccer all my life. I'm I'm shooting this club. 
but they've got a couple of brand new star players that are making history. I know I'm going to have to photograph them. Do you do specific research at that granular level? Uh, I mean, yes, I do. Um, you know, if I was photographing Messi, I would sit one side of the goal because I, I would know that that's the side he's more than likely going to be on. Um, you know, the shot we're going to talk about, I kind of learned about some of the intricacies of the player or the athlete as the tournament went on. And that really helped me um, when it came down to me taking this, this photograph. Um, oh, you know what? That's a perfect segue. Let's, let's, let's get into this. Let me bring this shot up. And again, just to remind everybody, if you're on audio and if you want to watch this or see this photograph and, and a small gallery sample of Simon's work, I've got on the website too. More importantly, I've got links to his Instagram and I've got links to Simon's website uh, up at the blog post at behindtheshot.tv. And again, YouTube, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. You know all that stuff. So let's get into this shot because this is one of those shots that as a fan of golf, the idea of being at the Masters I don't know that I would be able to be in this position and not just become a fan and just fanboy out at this point. So let me explain to you, Simon, what I normally do, because again, a lot of people listen on audio. I describe the shot verbally. Sure. It usually goes horribly awry, but I'm going to see what I, you know, how well I can do at it. And at the end, you can, you know, tell me, Steve, you're, you're an idiot and you missed X, Y, Z, but let's see how much of this I got. So okay. first of all, for those of you that don't know the masters, the masters is one of the majors on the PGA tour. This is clearly a major tournament. You can tell by the framing of this shot that this is a really nice golf course, beautiful day. It is a super wide angle shot and it is shot from a point of view directly behind the golfer as the golfer's in the tee box, perfectly mid-swing. And when I say mid-swing, think about swinging a club back up over your head and then back down at the ball. This is frozen in time as it is at the apex at the top of the swing. Driver is literally horizontal here. The camera angle, though, is what's super cool. So the camera angle is not, or at least doesn't appear to be, it's super wide angle, so I guess it could be, but it, the camera angle almost appears knee-high to the golfer as though Simon is down really, really super low. And what that does is it gives him the ability to get the full golfer in, the full gallery of people on the right, the bag, the golf bag on the left, but also the height of the trees to give you that environmental portrait feel, right? You see the trees, you see the sky, you see the cloud, which by the way, when you look at Simon's portfolio, you'll see he does that kind of Super wide, get the environment in a lot, which I absolutely love. It's a tailor-made, but everything is tack sharp. Caddies on the left, tailor-made bag on the left, as I said, crowd on the right. And this particular hole, you are looking straight down the fairway, trees on both sides. And here's where this gets amazing to me. These colors are insanely spot on. Like I literally feel like I'm standing at the Masters watching this happen. Top half of the body is above the tree line in the distance. So nothing is intersecting this golfer from the waist up. It's the old head in a clear spot type thing, but it's the entire part of the body that's got the movement, the moment, completely clean against the blue sky, not even really intersecting the clouds other than the club. And there are details absolutely everywhere. About right. Why do you need me on the show? Right. Well, you just described it so well. There's nothing because more I, I don't say. understand it. <laughs> so, for example, for, for those you made choices here, I don't understand. And I wish I thought this way. Right. I don't think this way and I need to. So let's start here. Canon EOS R5. According to the EXIF data, it's a 24 to 70 RF 24 to 70 2.8 IS. It yeah. shows that you were in manual mode. Do you always shoot manual mode? I mean, a lot of the time, yeah. It's when I can't work out the light and I start fussing with all the programs. Do you, but a do lot you, of times, you know, I'm in manual mode. Because I, mean, I, I know a lot of sports and outdoor photographers that shoot action do on occasion go aperture priority or 
you know, time value or whatever, shutter priority. Do you ever switch or you're like 90% manual? I'm like 99%. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, I mean, I, the, 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 those programs are great. Um, I mean, I just can't afford for it to make one small mistake. And then I'm buggered. So I kind of, if it's, if I'm going to make a mistake, I know where to go and I know who to speak to. Right. You, you, I know how to speak to you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I uh, can't call up Canon and say, for Christ's sake, man, what's going on? Your Is, camera made the wrong gonna, choice and I blame, lost the job. Yeah. Steve, we're going to blame somebody else if we can. It's within your nature to as a photographer. I mean, come on, you've heard it a million times. You know, oh, he jumped the other way or, you know, the light yeah. was in my eye. It was too sunny. It was too rainy. But when you still have to get the shot. To answer for that. You have to, I tell people all the time, I don't care what happens at that show, you still have to get the shot. And if if it's nothing but a silhouette against backlight and there are no front lights, you still have to tell the story. And right. you made choices here. ISO 200, F2.8, interesting. One <laughs> six hundredth of a second. The 2.8's interesting uh, I don't know what, uh, this was 24 millimeters, 24 millimeters on an R5 at 2.8 is a pretty shallow depth of field. Why is there so much detail here? T yeah, I mean, 24 good, is wide, but it's not 15. Yeah. yeah it's a good question that actually, I, I don't know what the answer is. I'm looking at the, I have the image up on the left here. Uh, yeah, it's a good answer. It's a good question for me there. I use a polarizer as well. Um, you shoot sports with a polarizer? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it was, come on, puffy white clouds, given. You know? That explains that. this color. Yeah, I had it I had it in my, um, you know, back, <sighs> blew the dust off and, you know, jammed it on the front of the 24 to 70. I mean, I, I thought about this image i knew this is not i mean as much as i want to tell you steve i was the only photographer there and no one's ever discovered this position before i would be lying because this is behind the 17th tee box and obviously it kind of you know yells the masters so what you can't see are the 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 the, the, the bundle the the group i don't know what the correct word for a shoal of photographers or a gaggle. gaggle of <laughs> yeah. But um, we are, if only the, you know, he, Dustin Johnson, that is, by the way, who won the tournament. If only he's, he could photograph us because it, it was a, it was a shit show back then. So th this is auto white balance, but okay. There's a gaggle of photographers behind Dustin Johnson here and you're at 24 millimeter. How close are you? Uh, not as close as you, as, as sometimes you are. I mean, I, I didn't have the 15 to 35 with me, so it was the only lens I had. So I was using it. Uh, and maybe I would have liked to have gone a little wider. But, you know, hey, it is what it is. You know, you've got to get on it, with it. I, I guess they're used to playing with, you know, people close to them. Look at the gallery on, on the one side. But the 600, so two things here strike me. The 2.8 for the depth of field is interesting to me. The polarizer is really interesting to me because that affected your shutter speed and you still managed to get one six hundredth of a second out of this. And I imagine for you, shutter speed oh, it is your priority. I mean, you know, the cameras have got so good now. I mean, you know, you talked earlier about how you had all those problems in, you know, photographing bands. I mean, yeah, we always dealt with that and we always were like really cognizant about how you know, you had to go low for quality. I mean, Christ, now it's 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 like, wow. Yeah. I mean, there are no limits almost, you know? Uh, and uh, so I, I still have that inherent sort of twitch in me to go low on the uh, ISOs, but really, I could have shot, I could have shot this at 5,000 ISO. And I don't know if anybody would have really said, hey, Simon, yeah, that's 5,000. That's terrible. But using the polarizer you know, got your shutter down to one six hundredth. And part of me wonders in my, in my head, like, which is not a place anybody wants to be in my head. 
a six hundredth of a second wouldn't freeze a downswing. It's sixteen, one thousand six hundred. Oh, okay. So I read the EXIF data or wrote the EXIF data down wrong. All right, yeah, that makes more sense then. It's sixteen hundredth of a second. Is that normal where for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I found with digital from analog to digital, the the shutter speeds were they they always seemed slightly off because you could shoot film with. Um, you know, get away with maybe a 250. You can never do that with bloody digital. You really have to go up there, crank it up, you know, over a thousand, 1600, 2000 okay. seconds. Um, yeah. But then I go to the 2.8 and I'd be worried about the depth of field. So I guess my question is, even though, okay, we know now that it came out all tack sharp <laughs> with tons of detail, nose to tail, do you always shoot a 2.8 and doesn't that put a little shiver down your spine of, oh my God, what if, you know, what if the club's in focus and he's not? I mean, I don't know what those other parts of the F stop are all about. 2.8 is it. You and I Go are going to get along really well. Because <laughs> 2.8 to me, I tell people, I put it at 2.8 because it, it simplifies the exposure triangle. All I got to worry about is my my <laughs> ISO and my shutter. The truth is, just give me 2.8 and I'm happy. That's really what it is. Are you kneeling? So I'm lying on the ground. Oh, you're prone? Yeah. Oh. To okay. so the left of me is a, um, there's the TV camera on a tripod, which is in the, has the perfect, position in the middle of the teeth box so that's taken that one spot where we'd all be and so we sort of you know molded our bodies around that and i'm lying and i know jamie squire from getty images was to my right and you know we were squeezed in and then there were like 10 or 12 photographers all trying to fit themselves it was like you know that game where you i've got the name of it you spin the dial and his colors. Oh, twister. twister. Twister, that was it. Yeah. Twister. twister. It was like Twister around this tripod, this camera tripod. And of course, you can't touch TV tripod. No, it I was, was just going to say, and, and the camera guy beam. loves that. Yeah, the laser beam would like fry you on the spot there. So um, so, so it's in the middle of the T-box. Because they obviously, they're, it's a remote camera. It's not a, it's not a man TV camera. So... You know, that the, the sort of, for me, I was shooting for Sports Illustrated, so it was, they weren't, they're not interested in every shot that Dustin Johnson makes on the back nine. They're interested in one image or two, you know. So I, I had thought about this image beforehand, so I, I had got there early, was, I knew what I wanted to do here. Um, the weather was perfect for shooting here. It's very close to the 16th green, which is, um, you know, a par three. And there's a good chance the golfer can make birdie there. So you can get a reaction shot. But I decided I wasn't going to do it. I was coming to the back of 17. This was going to be a shot I was going to make. And I was going so, to make myself be in the right spot. So with you, with you picturing this in your head, did you see the symmetry that you captured? Because that's one of the oh, yeah. things about this shot I should have mentioned early on. It's not just that the trees go up high, that you're low and that you're getting that environmental aspect of the portrait here, because it's really, it's an environmental portrait in many ways, but it's not just the golfer centered on those, on those trees in the distance, like the trees in the distance have this perfect dip right where he's at. It's it, you, you could not have said, Dustin move any better than you did. Yeah. But the symmetry that you got with, so a lot of people I could picture in my head photographing this and getting the gallery and leaving out the bag, but the bag balances the gallery, right? There's, 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 that's the symmetry partially, whether the golfer is dead center or not. Are, are you thinking that as you're looking through? So I, I, I certainly was, you know, the symmetry of, separating him from the trees was really important to me but the problem you have steve is that once you're in position i couldn't move you can't move i mean forget the fact there were 10 people 
sort of straddled across my back, the, the, the golfer would recognize straight away that you're moving. He would see it and would walk away from the tee shot. So, I mean, there's certainly, a, a, you know, an amount of luck involved with where he tees the ball up. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that I had seen him, um, you know, I'd photographed him a number of times during the tournament, and I noticed he was teeing the ball up a lot closer to the right-hand side on the tee boxes. And he did that on the 17th, and... I mean, maybe I'm, there's there's a good chance I'm inflating my own thought process here, of course. Um, but I, it it was somehow the synapses were firing, and that's what I was looking for. And it did come together, and he he separated himself. The golfer before was further to his left, and that image it does a, it's terrible. It's a See, terrible but you image. just you went back to what we talked about before. And that is when, when I had asked you about how do you keep attention through an entire game or an entire round of golf or whatever. And the, the, the wherewithal in your mind to be not only photographing, but be aware of those little things. Like you're literally studying your subject as they're shooting going, oh, he keeps teeing it up farther to the right. That's what to me makes... Uh, you know, a Simon compared to somebody else is the ability to, while you're out on that job, your mind is literally going, and I see this, and I see this, and I'm going to use that later so that you can get in these type of positions. But again, this is 24 millimeters. And I just keep thinking to myself, my God, man, are you ridiculously close here? Um, I mean, I've seen people throw golf clubs, although it's not the master's. So you're, this is like danger position, but. And we play together? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I've seen somebody launch a golf club to the top of a palm tree and everybody looked up at first like, oh, that's interesting. And then we all went, run, because yeah. you never know where it's going to land. This being shot on an R5, and I, I know because we talked about it in advance, you use the silent shutter for this. So sure. in for those that don't know, when you're shooting on a movie or a TV set, with its standard DSLR, the tradition is that you have what's called a blimp. And just think of it as a big case, like gigantic soundproof case around your camera. With silent shutter, Simon doesn't have to carry things like that on a golf course. Game changer, correct? Oh, as I said earlier, I mean, I can't tell you how excited I was. Uh, you know, earlier in the year, Steve, I'd gone to the, the US Open um, I think it was in late August. And uh, the first morning I'm out with the Mark III and this golfer, Jason Day, goes into the rough and I line up this image of him and I rip it on the motor drive. Fine, no problem. And then about a thousand yards away from me to the right, I hear these people shouting and screaming and I look over and the golfer's on the tee box. They're shouting at somebody. And I'm like, I'm looking around. Who are they shouting at? And I'm looking at them. They're shouting at me. That ripped motor drive of Jason Day upset them on the tee box. No crowd around. The place is empty. I'm standing there like Times Square with big arrows pointing at me. And I have to go and photograph those guys later on. So it was like, man, you got to get your stuff together here. And so I used the live view on the back of the uh, the Mark III, and I shot the rest of the tournament, you know, a little like this. I also had an R5 with me on the on the wide lens, and it's the only thing that saved me. I wouldn't have been able to to shoot because it was. I mean, golfers want it silent, and normally you're hiding amongst the crowd. No crowd. I mean, right. it is dead silent they can hear pretty much everything and i was like man if i i've, I've got to figure this out otherwise i'm not i'm going to be turfed out of here pretty quick uh could so we get the lighting guy I to did. put a spotlight on simon for us please <laughs> it's like <laughs> oh no they 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 will come and wake you out they'll they're definitely you know you've upset the golfer and they'll come and grab you out and uh you know you'll be in time out for a little bit What's if fascinating in that story, though, is that it, it's fascinating to me that it wasn't Jason Day that turned around. 
Well, no, because Jason, I was shooting him, and you know, I, look, as a when you're photographing golf, you've got to re respect the athlete, and you know, you don't fire on the top of their backswing. That's right, when okay. they can hear it. There's a there's a moment pause on the top of their backswing, Steve, when they can hear everything. But as soon as the club starts to move forward, it's game on for you. And so that's what I would do with Jason. You know, I was lashing him on the, you know, the motor drive. But little did I know the guys on the tee box a thousand yards away from me had ears like Bugs Bunny because it's dead silent. Now. So yeah, no. it checked. It checked. Right yeah, there that, in the that's I, I'd be afraid for my life at that that point. When you yeah. you said you were shooting this this tournament for Sports Illustrated, so there is a photojournalistic as, aspect to what you're doing versus if you are shooting for Canon, where it's more a commercial aspect. So you're going to have more limits on what you can do in post processing and stuff like that. What is your you, you shoot whatever it is, you come back, you ingest all of those images into the computer. What is your normal post-processing workflow i mean are you using lightroom or capture one or or photo mechanic or photoshop what 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 what's your flow pretty much yeah, photo mechanic um you know would have got an xmp or, or some sort of metadata already lined up download and upload um you know sports illustrated want to see the whole take they don't want to see any edits there's no edits Really? So they want to they want to see your whole take and then they edit and then they'll ask for the rules on their select. So okay, that's interesting. So do they want to see every shot, even the ones you normally would go, nobody's ever gonna see this one? Yeah. So you give them the entire they card. They get to see everything. Yeah. yeah. There's no yeah. Pretty much they get to see it, it all. And Warts if they and pick all. a shot, they come back to you for the edit? They come back and ask for the raw file to be uploaded. And then they upload. do the edit. So they will edit. I will send them uh, JPEGs, small JPEGs to edit from. And then from that edit that they do, they will ask for the raw files on the images they want. Interesting. So yeah. if it's a shoot not for like a Sports Illustrated, like a Canon or somebody like that, you, I'm assuming, do do your own edits. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I so photo mechanic I mean, I for culling. So definitely photo mechanic. For, yeah, editing. Yeah, I love. I mean, it's, it's super easy program to use. Pretty intuitive. What would you normally do to a shot? Like, assume this was not Sports Illustrated, this, this particular image. Would your editing tend to be more on the light-handed side? My, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It, for an editorial client, it would, yeah, there's, there's my editing. I mean, I, you know, some post-production, but I mean, darkroom stuff, you know, nothing, nothing. Dodging, burning, color but correction. The client, the client would see the image and then, you know, we discuss it if it needed other things done to it. Okay. So let's take it a different way. You've been doing what you do at a level most people will never, ever get to. There are very few people that shoot at the, at the quality and level and, and brilliance of the work that you present. So I'm curious, when you talk to aspiring sports or action or whatever you want to call it, right, photographers, and it could be, you know, mom and pop sitting on the sidelines shooting their son's AYSO soccer game, whatever it is, Sure. What's your one tip for shooting action photography? I know there's 30 of them, but if you were to pick one. <laughs> one, sell your cameras and, you know, have a good holiday. There you go. Have a nice dinner. Yeah. I love uh, it. <laughs> no, so, I'm not, not that much of a... Um, I... You know, I think backgrounds, I mean, the basics are important, to be honest with you. And Composition I stuff. Can't, I can't say one one thing, but basics. I mean, composition, you know, I mean, obviously, focus. How could you get that wrong? You know, I mean, you've got autofocus. Um, I think those things are really important. I mean, you mentioned it. You saw that, you know, with the photograph we're discussing, you know, the symmetry there. If I'd had him off, 
I couldn't have really, I would have been really upset for myself over that. Image. This shot would work otherwise, but there is no question. The, the symmetry is the shot in many, many sure. ways. I mean, obviously it's the subject of the shot, but you know what I mean? The symmetry makes this shot and, and a couple of slight compositional changes here really honestly could have, like you said, you shot one where the, somebody was, was, you know, a little yeah. bit further to the left and, no, and it's a no. completely different field just based on that, that compositional uh, tool. I mean, it wasn't even worth keeping. That's how bad it was. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, it's not, it's like night and day. Interesting. So last question, and, and I, I surprise people with this because I, I'm curious as to, to, you know, how this comes out. We all follow certain photographers that we like. For me, yeah. sometimes, most of the time, or at least a lot of the time, it's not even my genre. It's, it's I follow certain photographers on an Instagram or whatever or Twitter because they inspire me. And right. it could be, you know, uh, a Jack Resnicki or, or a Rick Salmon or a Scott Kelby or somebody like that who shoot nothing like what I shoot, although all three of those play guitar pretty much. Um, I'm curious for you, is there a photographer or artist or creative of some sort that you think people would like to see and should follow? Whew. And and I will say, like for me, I've never I never tell people this, but for me, I always mention almost the same photographer, which is Christy Goodwin. Christy's a friend of mine. And I love this woman dearly. She is the house photographer at Royal Albert Hall. And her work is amazing. Right. Even if you don't shoot music. She also does right. book covers and stuff like that. So she shoots a lot of things. But even if you don't shoot her genre, her her style will inspire. Who inspires you? I mean, the, I love looking at the, the older sports photographers who had to, I mean... What they had to endure, I mean, what what I do now, you know, with a waterproof camera, you know, with a light 400 two-way, you know, shoot on the top of the backswing, you know, with my Gore-Tex covers on, you know. I mean, Christ, those guys were in the mud, you know. Um, so I love the old sports photographer's work. I mean, I, I, I'm re super impressed with the way they still manage to create unbelievable i mean much more artwork than, than i am producing so for sure sports photography is obviously is dear to my heart and you know i got a glimpse and i know some of those guys um you know the walter yosas of this world uh for sure you know beautiful beautiful work as you were talking about unbelievable eye but of course you know with instagram you know you get this unbelievable ability to look at so many different photographers of work and obviously i follow tons of people not just photographers but artists um young guys patrick um smith from getty donald morales always pushing the envelope a little bit um so those guys are based around sports but they're also shooting outside of it so okay and then, Good you picks. know, the other thing is with that feed, you know, you just go down. We were talking about trying to be able to concentrate. You know, now they've got that feed at the bottom of it. And you just suddenly I'm looking at all these unbelievable landscape photographers. And I'm like, Christ. Yeah, I have found myself more and more clicking on hashtags. And, right. you know, I'll go to a music hashtag that's just random and I'll right. find amazing photographers that no one will ever mention because they have like 100 followers. Yeah. Right. And they're they're literally brilliant. I mean, this work yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. And I don't care what they did to get it. What they're presenting to me is amazing and inspiring and great. And it's because I would have never found them. Yeah, it's also depressive because I'm like, Jesus, that's <laughs> yeah. so great. I'm never going to get another job in my life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're how old? Could you start <laughs> shooting my pictures for me? I can't lift I'm the 5D4 anymore. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if people want to connect with Simon Broody, 
uh, simonbrudy.com. And by the way, for those of you that are listening on audio, if you're watching on the video, lower thirds have been coming up. If you're, if you're listening to the audio version, go to the website, you'll, all the links are there, but I just want to say them out loud for the audio folks so that they know where to go. Uh, the website, simonbrudy.com. It's B R U T Y, right? Yep. Instagram. You have two accounts. You have at Simon Brudy, and then you have yeah. at any chance underscore. What is the any chance underscore? I just wanted somewhere where, you know, I could, I don't have to feel somewhat obligated. And I wanted one for the sport and one for things that, you know, intrigued me, you know. I mean, I try hard to make them, you know, good. I mean, I'm, it's not just any old crap. It's not another food shop for what I'm eating. But I just felt it was important for me. It's overflow. It's overflow stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Everybody overflow. again. Links are, HR, behind... Simon. <laughs> <laughs> Links are at behind the shot TV. Simon, dude, this has been awesome. I'm, yeah, thanks, I am so glad to have you on this show because seriously, and, and we're, we were joking about making you blush earlier, but all kidding aside, your work, sir, is absolutely fantastic. I am, the, that, that one award we mentioned 50 greatest, you know, one of the 50 greatest or in the list of the 50 greatest, sports photographs. No question about it. Simon, thank you so very much. I really appreciate your time. Steve, thank you. Thank you for having me on. When I get out to sunny West Coast, first whiskey's on me, mate. Okay. Second second whiskey's on me. That would be fun. <laughs> and if I come back to DC, which is one of my favorite cities that I visited, uh, hey. I will I will be sure to uh, to hit you up as well. To everybody else, just a reminder for you, if you want to reach out to me, it's BehindTheShot.tv or my website is Steve Brazel, like Brazil, but two L's, dot com. Uh, BehindTheShot.tv, but the Steve Brazel is dot com. If you want to hit me up on social media, that's easy as well. It's either at Steve Brazel or at BehindTheShotTV on either Twitter or Instagram. I spend most of my time on Twitter nowadays, but I'm active on Instagram as well, and I hope to see you there. And if you want to subscribe to the podcast, make sure that you do that wherever you get your podcasts, audio or video. And if you are on YouTube, just a final reminder, head down, hit the subscribe button, bang the bell. Otherwise, you're subscribed and still won't know what I do. Thanks so much, as always, for the support. I hear from you guys a lot on social media, and it's much, much, much appreciated. I'm Steve Brazel, and this is where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. I'll see you on the next show. 